Hello, welcome to Family Network on Disabilities, Beginning the Journey. Last week, we discussed Beginning the Journey, Part 1. Today, we're talking about Part 2, which explains the process of transitioning from early intervention services, ages 0 to 3, or Part C, to school age services, ages three to 22 or part B. I'd like to welcome you all here today. My name is Kipwana Wright. I'm the Poppin Parent Trainer for Northeast Florida. And I am here under dual hats, first as a professional, working with children, uh, families with children with disabilities, and also a parent with children with disabilities. I first learned about special education and the process through speaking with another parent. She was uh, telling me about some of the challenges she was having with her child and uh, his education, telling me some of the challenges he was facing uh, with his curriculum and with the general education teacher. It was through that conversation that I realized a lot of what she was going through with her child was very similar to what I was facing with mine. And it was from that conversation that I decided to get my child evaluated. And from then we were thrusted into the special education process. And I had never known anyone in special education. And so this was all very new to me. And so I had to learn how to uh, advocate for my child, how to navigate the special education process, and how to help my child uh, learn how to advocate for herself. And so it is an awesome opportunity to have uh, an organization like Family Network on Disabilities uh, available to help other families to understand the special education process. So let's talk about FND. FND is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Uh, we do not work for local or state or federal agencies or schools. We are funded in part by the U.S. Department of Education and U.S. Department of Health. We offer free services because we have uh, been awarded grants to help parents learn about the special education process here in Florida. We are a statewide parent trainer information center or a PTI. And we are also the Family to Family Health Information Center here in Florida as well. FND is family driven. We have we were founded in 1985 by parents of children with disabilities. Uh, who just came together looking for mutual supports and uh, a chance to share information. Family Network on Disabilities is a national network for individuals of all ages who may be at risk, have disabilities, or have special needs in their families. We also serve professionals and concerned citizens. FND is unique because the majority of our program staff, our board members, and our management staff are all family members who have children with disabilities or have other family members with disabilities. And so Family Network uh, on, on Disabilities, is we are not doctors, we are not lawyers, and nothing that you hear in our workshop today can be considered as legal or medical advice. However, we are excited about sharing uh, our resources and supports for you and your family. All information that we share is uh, evidence-based materials 
from federally funded organizations. And we encourage collaboration with schools and other agencies. So transition into early steps. So again, last week we talked about early steps and um, the IFSP um, and how uh, they identified children birth to three. So Although this presentation has been specifically created to provide families more information on transition uh, services from early steps to schools to the school system. We want to share some brief information for those families whose child might not be found eligible for school district pre kindergarten program for children with disabilities. In the case of a child who may not be eligible for school for the school district pre-kindergarten program for children with disabilities, uh, the local early steps or LES must, uh, with approval um, of the family, make reasonable efforts to convene uh, to convene a conference among the LES, the family providers of appropriate services for the child before the child's third birthday to discuss appropriate services uh, that the child may receive. A transition conference must be held uh, with the participation of family members, service coordinators, and other potential service providers with the approval of the family. Even though these students are not eligible for a school district pre-kindergarten program for children with disabilities, they may qualify for Head Start. The Agency for Persons with Disabilities, uh, Early Care and Education Programs, or other community options. If the child is found eligible, for IDEA, transition from Part C to Part B, the initial planning for transition must begin six to nine months before your child turns three. The local early steps must notify the school district of the, of the children who will shortly reach the age of eligibility for preschool services under Part B. If the Early Steps program considers that your child may be found eligible, they will inform you and request your consent to refer the child to the local school district for evaluation. If your child qualifies, he, is going, he or she will uh, transition to the pre-kindergarten program for children with disabilities. Your child can start attending school the same day he turns three, he or she turns three years old. Parent involvement is a big piece of this transition. And the tr uh, provision of the right services for the child. We will also review procedural safeguards. Uh, so you are aware of your rights and responsibilities. So transition from early intervention to pre-K program uh, for children with disabilities. This can be an anxious time for parents. It's difficult enough to send your five-year-old -year off, five off to kindergarten, but now you're considering sending your three-year-old off to a big school. And you may be thinking, ah, you know, that, that, that can be a difficult thing to process. You know, is your child too young? Is my child ready? Um, will my child be able to do, um, do things like feed him or herself, go to the restroom? Uh, they're barely walking well by the age of three, you know? So 
there's a lot to consider when you are sending your three-year-old off to a kindergarten program. Many times uh, parents may panic when they learn that their child does not uh, does qualify for special education services. And it's only natural uh, to have questions and have those concerns. This is the beginning of the transition process. Transition is generally defined as the process or the period of changing from one state or condition to another. So on the other hand, some families are upset if their child does not qualify. It is important to remember that in order for your child to qualify for these services, his or her disability must impede their ability to learn without academic supports. So during this transition process, the LES or local early steps will provide notification to the local school district in which the child resides for child find. Purposes uh, and, and for child find purposes, to find the Department of Education that the child may be eligible uh, to receive preschool services or uh, pre-kindergarten services through. The Pre-Kindergarten Exceptional Student Program or Pre-K ESE program is voluntary. Parents have the right to reject their services. For that, they must inform the service, service coordinator and complete the opt-out form to avoid the release of information to the school district and the DOE, Department of Education. At this point, the parents have the right to enroll their child in private pre-K pro in a private pre-K program. The for that, the Gardner, Gardner uh, Scholarship is available. So what happens next? So let's assume that you want to go forward with the eligibility determination. The school di district will schedule a, uh, an appointment uh, to talk about transition, a, a transition conference. Districts schedule two different meetings, one for evaluation and the other for eligibility determination. It can also be sometime on the same days, but you'll take a break and go move into the second meeting. You can ask for copies of all evaluations before the eligibility meeting. If the child is eligible, then the IEP is developed as a team. And the IEP, again, is the individualized education plan. So when they are zero to three, um, in early steps, they have the IFSP, which is the individual family support plan. And then when they turn three years old and they qualify, and are found eligible, they will receive an IEP, which is the Individual Education Plan. And you see here, that's ages three to 21. And when they come up with the uh, IEP, it's usually a team of multidisciplinary team of people who come together and uh, along with the parent, decide uh, what services the child is eligible for within uh, the school system. And so they will, you, the parent, along with the team, will discuss uh, the strengths and some of the um, challenges that the child faces. Um, they will put together 
as a team some supports so that the child will reach certain goals and milestones. And uh, this is again, done as a team with the parent in the center. The purpose of the IEP, okay? The IEP has two general purposes. Again, first to establish measurable annual goals for the child and to state the special education and related services and supplementary aids uh, and services that uh, the public agency will provide or uh, on the behalf of the child. Although the IEP is not a binding contract that promises outcomes. It does guarantee that services will be provided to attempt to assist the child in reaching those outcomes that are outlined inside of the IEP. So how can parents become active participants? It is very, very important to understand that parents are equal members on the team. Parents are not the last. Parents are not uh, less than. Um, I know sometimes you can go in these meetings and uh, you're in the meeting with doctor this person and uh, doctor that person. And it can sometimes seem that parents are just the parents. I'm just uh, this child's parent. And that is not true. Parents hold the biggest part of this pie uh, because you are the teacher, the child's first teachers. You are uh, the persons who know the child best and know the child most. And provide valuable, very valuable and weighted information to the team as, in whole, as a whole. So um, we want parents to understand you are very uh, big stakeholders in this team. So again, parents are over 50% of the IEP team, no matter how many people from the school are in the room the parents hold the biggest part of the team. Parents also have the right to disagree. Um, if a parent disagrees with anything on the IEP, make sure that it's recorded in the minutes. In this IEP team, you will have a person who is taking down notes and recording everything that is happening, everything that the parent uh, felt was important to mention, um, and it's all being taken down in the notes. So parents provide very unique and pertinent information for the child and advocate for the child's well-being. You are the expert on the child. So at the end of the, the meeting, you give explicit consent. You are asked to sign certain documents about your child's education that will make sure the school is, has fully explained to you what will happen, the placement, where the child, uh, what classrooms the child will be in, how long they're in those classrooms, what other supports will the child have a pair of, how long, what times the child would have a pair of. Though all of those things must be explained to you in for the IEP. And to make sure that they are ex explained, you must sign off that you have received the information and that you understand it fully. And if not, you have the right to ask questions. So what can you do in the meantime? Give your child 
natural opportunities at home to gain independence based on his or her personal abilities and structure. Structure is vital to little children. Develop a bedtime routine and make sure they have a, a specific bedtime, bath time, brushing teeth, picking out clothes for the next day, uh, and reading. Develop a morning routine as well. Uh, what time are they eating or how long a time they have to eat, uh, brushing teeth, uh, make sure their backpacks are ready. So uh, helping the child to develop a structure that is um, that will keep them on a daily routine, something that they're familiar with and that they'll see in a school setting uh, that is more structured than the home. So IEPs are reviewed once a year and usually at the end of the school year. The IEP is a live document and can be revised as needed. So don't stress out. If there's something that didn't work uh, during the school year and uh, you and the team really tried to work on it, you can always, even though it's re uh, revised once a year, reviewed once a year, you're able to request a revision or a, a review of the IEP and the supports anytime you would like, okay? So, but it takes teamwork. And um, an effective parent and teacher conferences, so uh, allow the process to work for you. Um, when you're talking with the uh, with and communicating with the teacher and with the team, uh, say the um, special education coordinator, um, it can help alleviate some of the stress off of what's working and how to get things uh, to work. So um, keep the communication open and and stay in communication with the team. So we have the procedural safeguards. One we wanna talk about is records, confidentiality, and the release of information. Parents have the right to request a copy of their child's records at any time. Uh, the first copy will be pro provided for free. Um, prior, uh, prior written notice or and native language. Uh, you must be given prior written notice in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time before early steps or a service provider proposes to initiate a change or refuses to initiate a change um, or says that they're going to have an, uh, do an evaluation on the child or they have to tell you uh, prior to changing the child's placement. So um, early written notice will give you an appropriate amount of time to uh, let you know what is happening. They won't do it and then let you know. They will give you enough time to where you are able to write or email or ask questions before anything is changed. The notice will help you be more prepared and will state information, including the action that is being proposed or refused, the reason for taking action or refusing action, all procedural safeguards that are available under early steps and, and, um, and the school system. Um, you can also uh, file a complaint with these um, by following the complaint procedures and timelines. Parental consent. Early steps needs your permission to take action that, that take actions that affect your child. 
you will be asked to give your consent in writing before Early Steps conducts the screening. Evaluations or assessments, private insurance is used to personally um, I, uh, or personally identifiable information is disclosed or before early steps intervention services are provi provided. Consent mean, means that you are fully informed in your native language or other mode of communication of all information related to the activity that Early Steps is requesting uh, your consent for. And that you understand and agree in writing to carry out the activity in which uh, your consent is being requested. And the consent describes the activity and list the records, if any, that will be released and to whom they are being released to. Surrogate parents. If a child is a ward of the state, a surrogate parent may be appointed by the judge seeing, overseeing the infant or toddler's case provided that the surrogate parent meets federal and state requirements. Mediation. Mediation is free to you and does not interfere with your right to due process hearing or any other rights under early steps. Mediation discussions are confidential and will not be used in subsequent due process hearings or civil proceedings. Mediation will be scheduled in a timely manner within 21 calendar days of the receipt of a request, uh, a signed request by both parties and will be held in a location that is convenient to all parties. Any uh, agreements reached in mediation will be put in writing and signed by all parties. Complaint procedures. You have the right to file a complaint alleging that early steps or a service provider has violated your requirements of or violated a requirement of early steps. Complaints must be written and signed under uh, signed and included in the following information. A statement that early steps or services providers has violated your rights. The facts on which the complaint is based. Your signature and contract information. The name and address of the residence of the child. A description of the nature of the problem of the child, including facts relating to the problem. A proposed resolution of the problem to the extent known and available to you at the time the complaint is filed. An allegation of the violation that occurred within one year prior to the date of the complaint is received. Complaints must be mailed to the Florida Department of Health, Children's Medical Services, uh, uh, Early Steps Office, the IDEA um, Part C Coordinator, Department of Health, Children's Medical Services, Early Steps State Office at 4052 Bald Cypress Way, A. 06 in Tallahassee, Florida, 32399. That is the address. And I can place that down in the comments. Due process hearing. You have the right to file a due process hearing request when there is a disagreement regarding the proposal to initiate or change or refusal to initiate or change the identification, evaluation, or placement of your child. The provision of appropriate early intervention services to your child or family to do 
uh, to challenge information in early steps record is to ensure that it is not inappropriate, misleading, or otherwise in violation of the privacy or other rights of your child. A due process hearing request must be filed with the Florida Department of Children's and Medical Services Early Steps Office. And again, I will place that address in uh, the comments. A party submitting due process hearing requests or their attorney must ensure that the other party receives a copy of the hearing request which must remain confidential. A due process hearing request must include the following, the child's name, the address where the child uh, resides, uh, the name of the early intervention uh, provider servicing the child, a description of the nature of the problem of your child relating to the proposed or refused uh, information initiation or change, including facts relating to the problem. An explanation why uh, early steps proposed or refused to take the action raised in the due process hearing. A description of the other options that the IFSP team uh, considered and the reason why those options were rejected a description of each evaluation procedure and assessment and a record or report used uh, as the basis of the proposed refusal of action and the description of the uh, factors relevant to the proposed or refused action. The hearing officer will determine the sufficiency of a due process hearing. Either party may challenge the sufficiency of the due process hearing re requesting by filing a claim with the hearing officer within 15 days of the hearing request. Within five days of receipt the challenge uh, of the challenge, the hearing officer will issue a ruling on the sufficiency of the due process hearing request. Again, parents have the right to refuse services or stop them at any time. Parents have the right to disagree and be active, be an active participant in every point of the decision-making process for that child. They have the right to explicit consent, which means consent as a result of an educated decision. So more about uh, FND. Um, FND, we have uh, five uh, regions of FND. First, again, we have Poppin, which is the upper, uh, the northeastern uh, portions of Florida. We have PSN, which covers the central uh, in the south south central part of Florida. And we have a uh, pin which covers the central and east portions of uh, central and southeast portions of Florida, counties of Florida. Uh, we also have the um, Family Star, which is the program which is funded by the Department of Health and Health Resources and uh, Health Resources Services Administration. Family Star is the um, CYSHCN or the Family to Family Health Care uh, portion of FND. We also have the FND Special Needs Trust, which provides comprehensive special needs trust services, including services as a trustee, co trustee, and trust administrator. And FND handles all types of special needs trusts. We also have the Davocates program, 
Advocates is a national network of fathers who come together to um, uh, for mutual supports um, and coping, uh, help with coping with children with disabilities and to help uh, promote uh, father participation. And so we can provide workshops for any kind of gathering of fathers that is uh, happening. We also have the ESE downloadables on our website. You can go to fndusa.org and click on ESE downloadables and you can find just a plethora of one pagers, tip sheets, um, things, resources that you may uh, need to uh, have, you might have questions about. So you can go there. Uh, to our downloadable resources. We also have um, all of our resources in Spanish and other languages such as um, Russian and Creole as well. Okay, um, we also have FND University, which is a non-credited online uh, special uh, system specially designed to help parents and professionals learn more about the special education process at their own pace. You can find us on all social media platforms. And again, if you need more information, you can contact FND uh, through email or giving us a call at 727-523-1130. We are here to serve you. So thank you again for joining me here for uh, the journey, beginning the journey part two.